So why are we here? <laughs> what are we doing? Here? Yeah, no, I'm Jeff Wu, Joey Levy. Joey Levy. I would yeah. say now, just deep in the trenches, friends, business partners, trying to take over the world together. But I think just like stepping back, I think I've wanted to get back in the content creation game, started ramping up my own content, but used to run a podcast mainly towards human performance and right, got I really cool guests. That. And that was like, yeah. honestly, one of the best hacks to meet people. Yeah. And obviously you being CEO of Better and just creating a media empire of sorts we've just seen just the excitement around authentic content creation and i think that is just one pillar of what we're doing here today and i think too we know and our friends with folks at the all-in podcast who yep. are i would say like the 50 60 year old billionaire versions of us who have been there done that where we're in our 20s and 30s i think we will get to that level where we're going to give you guys content of us actually building raising money, building businesses, making mistakes, and taking that journey along with us. I think that is something that I know people want to learn, yeah. right? I think people see better, they see anti-fund, they see all the business that were around, all the talent, the celebrity, the venture capitalist, the money, and oftentimes it's intimidating or scary or mysterious. And I've just known you when we were just like grinding it out with like just a few of us without an office, just seeing this massive entity grow handshake on the D dorado beach yeah a little bit less than three years ago now yeah i mean 375 million post money valuation and, and and more to come so i think there is going to be a lot of interest and demand from just our followers friends and just unpacking a lot of those conversations and just demystifying venture capital and tech so that's my intent coming to this i'm curious your perspective yeah no i think that's super well said and um you know, you mentioned sort of building a media empire here at Better and, and huge shout out to, to Mike Denevi, who's who's back over there for really leading the, the charge on that front. Because as you know, I've been kind of like a sports gaming nerd my, my entire life. Like I've been down the sports gaming rabbit hole for really the entirety of my adult life. The, the, the last uh, 10 years or so, I uh, founded my first company in 2014, which was a, a daily fantasy sports startup back in the early days of like FanDuel DraftKings, um, ended up dropping out of Columbia to do that business full time, became one of the early Teal Fellows, uh, exited uh, that business in 2017, and then ended up starting a project that ultimately became a company called Simple Bet, which was actually the first initial way we started working together. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And um, and then started Simple Bet essentially to do what we're doing it better and you know, ended up realizing there was a real dearth of bespoke content for U.S. sports after the U.S. market opened up. So ended up, you know, one thing led to another and we ended up being a B2B technology company that pioneered a new form of betting called micro betting that didn't really like make a lot of sense for soccer, but made a lot of sense for U.S. sports given the cadence and composition of them. Um, so ended up going down the route of building a B2B technology business in U.S. sports gaming and then ultimately, and we met each other when I was contemplating um, you know, spinning out direct to consumer from Simple Better, not really contemplating it, figuring out how to do it. Yeah. And then ultimately we decided to, to partner, you know, with, with you and Jake and Nikisa and, and, and making this happen. But I bring all of that up not to give my bio and happy to, you know, get into more of the details later on, but more so to highlight the fact that all of this content creation and media stuff is totally new to me. You know, I've just been focused on developing these sports gaming products, but what I've learned you know, along the way, working with you, working with Jake and then Mike Denevi and, you know, some of the amazing people we, he, we have here at Better Media is that authentic, original, funny content creation that really, you know, goes direct to consumer and is not sort of fabricated and in sort of the, the FanDuel DraftKings-like mold really provides significant unfair advantages when you're out there trying to acquire customers, but not even just direct customer acquisition, but building a brand that really resonates with people, has affinity with people. It'll, the, the awareness will come because the content is of high quality. It's genuine. There's not a lot of people doing it this way. So if we could replicate some of that and bring it to young entrepreneurs who, you know, maybe have an idea for the first time, have no idea where to go to, to raise capital, um, to evangelize their ideas, to recruit a team if we could help even a handful of entrepreneurs i think it's worth our time to 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 do this 
and it's interesting because we're in the thick of it, right? Like, I guess, unlike the, the all in guys who are still, you know, very active and incredibly smart and, and hope to one day be as successful as they are. You know, I'm, I'm 28 year old entrepreneur. I think you're in your early to mid thirties, like, and, and we're, we, we're not anywhere close to where we ultimately want to be, but we're in the thick of it. So I think some of the anecdotes that we could probably articulate here are perhaps a little bit more contextually relevant to an audience that is just getting going or, or starting to get going because we're living and breathing it and, you know, dealing with all the highs and lows in real time. Yeah. So, And I think we're going to just have fun with this on this episode, and I'm sure we'll get feedback from you guys in terms of whether it's more just like tactical one-on-one or, or just venture capital one, like 101, which is like, you know, what? how do you select a board director, board of directors? What are good board directors or bad ones? Fundraising mistakes, hiring lessons, or we could just talk about war stories and anecdotes. Um, I think that's all on the table for us. And I think the ambition here is that uh, – We've already, you know, it, it, it's just like a, such a small ecosystem where I think it'd be so fun to have a David Sachs or Chamath on our pod if we get to that point and just like trade notes in terms of how they scale their media empire. Maybe just even at the meta level, you know, when I've been thinking about business formation and content, I feel like it is incumbent for every single founder to make that decision early. You're going to have a media presence and a content creation presence or not. And I have very successful friends who just deliberately do not want to be forward facing in front of media because they don't want the heat. They want they don't want the target on their back. They'd rather be wealthy and anonymous, and it's like a very very great lifestyle. Yeah. I think the fact that you're running better, yeah. or we're doing business with Jake Paul, yeah. uh, who is loud as fuck. Um, I think that choice has been made for us yeah. in the sense that like you have to be forward facing, otherwise you're not exploiting an advantage, right? Like if you have one of the most attention grabbing humans in the world right now as a business partner and you don't exploit that it's it's just like leaving value on the table like you wouldn't be a good entrepreneur so i'm curious in terms of just your thought process there even just the meta level um like going public being a character being in front of the camera and i i really do think it's a one-way door like yeah. you're not anonymous anymore right like you're i just saw you on cnbc you're giving uh they, they panels try, and try, try to get me a little bit yeah, and I'm sure they want to, you know, give you a hard question and, and no, it's all good. And, Contessa's and, and great. Slam you. And she she asked fair questions. It was, yeah. it was fine. Um, but no, yeah, what you're saying is interesting because before we announced better, I think my Instagram had like 1,500 followers, and I think I may have been on private. And um, yeah, I think it was just like high school, college, etc. Friends. And, you know, I would like periodically post business stuff every now and then, but that was more just to update like my friends and family on like what I was doing. And then I haven't even really been that active on social. I've been a little bit more active more recently because I kind of started realizing what you're articulating, which is there is value in, in sort of, you know, being more public facing and sharing what you're working on and you know, have a little bit of a following now and, and kind of realize that there's some momentum there. I think there's a, there's a, there's an opportunity to benefit from that public facing persona, particularly in, in, in our industries where, you know, in venture capital, for example, and in sports gaming, they're historically run by these, you know, older people, 50s, 60s, et cetera, that tend to operate behind closed doors. And, maybe the only times they'll sort of be more public facing is they'll do the once a quarter, twice a year CNBC type interview and they'll be on for like five minutes and they'll get their key talking points out there. And then otherwise they'll sort of hide behind their PR teams and get their messaging out through press releases and things like that. But again, back to that ilk of like what we're seeing on the customer acquisition side with respect to, consistent, high-frequency, original content really resonating with consumers from a brand development perspective, I think providing a lower barrier to entry for people looking to get into business, whether it's venture capital or operating a company, um, could be a strategy to unlocking value from you know customers of your products, um, prospective investment partners who want to know who they're backing. And I read something interesting the other day where I think it said that 
consumers aren't necessarily buying into brands, but they're buying into the people behind those brands, right? They want they want to know why the individuals are creating that different product. I think that's definitely our generation and Gen Z. Yeah. Right? Like, no one wants to buy from a multinational corporation that's yeah. anonymous. It's like people want to vote with their dollar supporting people that they like and yeah. the values that they like, 100%. So, yeah. I mean, short answer is I, I see the value in it. Yeah. I'm open to doing it more. And, um, and I don't even think it... I think some people might perceive it as an ego thing, which may be the case. Obviously, you get some likes and dopamine hits for more engagement. But I really think it's a shareholder value decision for me. The more respected you are as a CEO, as a founder, as a business person, the easier it is for you to hire people. The yep. easier it is for you to raise downstream capital. Like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos can raise infinite capital because they're just regarded as the best entrepreneurs in our generation. Yeah. So I think there's a power law momentum f around disreputation. And of course, reputation is earned by results, metrics, driving business results. But having the extra little sizzle of a media personality and thought leadership is value on the table to grab, right? Like as an entrepreneur, you need to gain every single little advantage over your competition. Yep. And if you can be a thought leader, a media personality, in addition to be a legit bona fide CEO and investor and a capital allocator, why not have that extra arrow in the quiver yep. to compete with other entrepreneurs that compete with your space, right? Like I respect this is so hard to just get above the noise. But if you have a little bit of a channel to put your propaganda out there, if you yeah. will, yeah, yeah. I'm taking it, right? So I think it's not just an ego thing. If any, And I think all of us have relative different levels of ego. And if I just abstract away ego, I still think it's a positive expected value play. Yeah, no, I tend to agree. And also what what's interesting about what we're discussing doing here is that, and I kind of described this to, to somebody on the team, described it this way to somebody on the team a couple of days ago is that like me and you kind of have these conversations oftentimes anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's not like we're doing anything totally different than like a phone call we'll have or a dinner conversation we'll have. It's just, there's a mic here and there's a camera over there, but otherwise it's, so my point is it's not even like we're allocating that much incremental time that we would be spending doing other things. Obviously we're incredibly busy and we're taking time out of our day to do this right now, but you know, we'll end up having a phone conversation or a dinner where we probably have a similar conversation like this on a monthly basis anyway. Yeah. So if we could just open that up a little bit and create value for ourselves and create value for other young entrepreneurs and investors out there, then, then why not? I think maybe just even just to frame up just a little bit of a structure for budding entrepreneurs. I oftentimes get a lot of questions around just demystifying fundraising and venture capital. Right. And I think, and I, I, I mean this like not blowing smoke up your butt. You're, you're absolutely one of the best fundraisers I've seen operate. I mean, I think raising a hundred million plus in equity for a three year old business. Two, two years and, and two months. Two, but Okay. Yeah. Or since we shook hands, it's been... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It depends on when we want to count the start date. But yeah, yeah I yeah, think yeah. in terms of just like getting this to launch, yeah. yeah, less, you know, about two years is insane amount of uh, allocation. Uh, you were able to just marshal a lot of resources Yeah. Um, very, very quickly. One of the key questions I always get, I'm curious to hear your perspective, especially given that you've been excellent at this, is marshalling resources, raising capital. I mean, this is public and it's fully announced now, but yep. with Better, you've been spearheading and have raised over $100 million of equity for a business that's really been on market for two years, maybe a little bit longer since we you know, set everything up, but really just out in public for two years, which is a rapid clip, right? Like that is such a high bar to, to get to, right? $100 million, uh, Marshall is, I mean, I just, you can move a lot of atoms in the world with a hundred million dollars. What has worked for you? What are, what are the best non-obvious tips you can give? So it sounds like a lot of money in a short period of time, but you know, I, as I alluded to earlier, I've been at kind of solving or trying to solve this same exact problem or a very similar set of problems for my entire adult life. And really, as you know, I started my prior company, Simple Bet, to do what we're doing it better. So kind of inadvertently built a B2B technology business with, you know, some fits and starts, but ultimately figured it out along the way. So 
we were able to hit the ground running because we kind of had gone through a lot of the reps in this category and knew exactly what we were trying to set out to accomplish both from a product perspective and a distribution perspective. And as a result of that, just had a plan from day one that I think intuitively made a lot of sense to both ourselves as the team and our initial employees, but also to the investment community. And something that I remember a lot of the, you know, net new investors say, because remember we, you know, I had raised collectively at Simple about about $80 million leading up to this and, you know, was very grateful to have a lot of those investors come over with us to better. So that also provided an, an unfair advantage to just kind of having that built in network and, you know, people that I had had mutual success with already wanting to further support along the way. Uh, but, you know, we raised money from net new investors as well. And, and, and the one thing that I remember them consistently saying across the board was when they read our series a memo there was just like a profound sort of clarity of vision right it wasn't like oh there's this big market and we could do this or we could do that and you know there's opportunities here and there etc it's like no like we were very clear from day one with exactly what we wanted to do with respect to product to simplify the product experience make it intuitive enough for anybody who had never played fantasy or bet bet on sports before to just pick up the product and interact with it with the objective of, of creating incremental TAM and on the distribution side to build a bona fide media business initially catalyzed by Jake Paul that focused on original content that would resonate with um, a new demographic of prospective customers that fit very nicely into our product thesis of creating incremental TAM for people who weren't hardcore sports gamblers that intuitively understood what minus 175 money lines meant, plus five and a half point spreads, et cetera. So we were very clear and concise with what we were trying to do from day one. And I think that clarity of vision gave investors confidence that like, like they were able to read that and know exactly what we were doing. There wasn't a, you know, uh, of there, there was an ambiguity around that. So I think that that's really important. Like the clarity of, of vision and strategy from day one to the extent possible is important. Um, yeah. And I'll just like chime in with my venture capitalist hat on, which is that uh, you had a right as a founder to win in this category. So oftentimes there are a lot of people that want to build the next big social network or they're like, Hey, I want to build the next big, boxing company or a sports betting app, but they just don't actually have the technical or industry depth and experience. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to add to that. Sorry to cut you off, yeah. but y you know, the domain expertise helps, yeah. right? So that's why if you're, if you're an entrepreneur watching this and you know, let's say you really like, I'm just going to use sports betting as an example, because that that's what we're talking about. And you have an idea for a sports betting business, instead of just starting it from scratch, maybe consider working at, an interesting startup, you know, may, maybe, maybe not better because we're not looking for people to, to be <laughs> here and then go on and do something else. But although if or, they do, that's or, fine. Or that's if fine, they, right? no, even if they do, that's fine. Yeah. I just, 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 just give me like five to seven years, but, <laughs> um, go, go work at an, go work at DraftKings, right. And, and learn a little bit about the ins and outs and, you know, get that domain expertise and, you know, form relationships with people across different departments, you know, learn about acquisition, learn about retention, learn about product design, learn about, you know, at, at a high level engineering, even if you're not technical, just understand how the different components and work with one another. problems that aren't being solved. Yes, yes, right? of, of which there are many. Yeah. <laughs> and this category is particularly interesting because you essentially have eight, com eight D to C companies, excluding underdog and better, that are getting more into OSB now. You have eight D to C companies that or multi-billion dollar sort of conglomerate type businesses that those are the only ones that are really investing in the category and have a shot. But you're going to have textbook innovators dilemma all over the place because they're all making so much money and they're focused on their quarterly earnings that there are so many different parts of the value chain in this category that, you know, nimble startup technology teams can go after and solve. And as you know, I do a lot of investing on the side and you know, I, I've had a lot of success investing in startups in this category because there's so many different problems to solve and they're just better off being solved by young technical teams that, you know, know how to solve these problems. And 
it intuitively makes a lot of sense why DraftKings isn't solving all of that. No. They shouldn't be. Yeah, and I think that is where I, for folks that just like look at Joey as a 28 year old, they're like, oh, how is a you know some kid in his 20s be able to run? Well, hopefully, it will be a multi billion dollar betting company. It's like, well, as as you've hinted at, you've been building and building industry experience and domain expertise for 10 years, trying to get a fantasy sports app out of when it was still you know pre PAPSA, where it was illegal essentially to play with some of these things. Um, so in terms of the time dimension might look young in terms of object, like absolute age, but like you have, you're a 10 plus year veteran. Not, not only that, but it, it's also to your point that PASPA was repealed. So PASPA was the federal ban on sports betting that the Supreme Court repealed in May of 2018. So the regulated category in the United States is, is only yeah, six years uh, old. It's a little bit less than six years yeah. old, right? So... There, there's a few zero. of us like yeah. like Adam Wexler from Prize Picks, Jeremy Levine from Underdog, Jason Robbins from DraftKings. You know, we there's a few of us that have been involved in the industry at a high level from before yeah. 2018. So we all kind of have you know a bit of an advantage, just given. I mean, Scott Mailwig, who who's here at, at at Better. I mean, he he's been involved in it longer than all of us. He he was the product lead at uh, at Draft Day, which uh, was founded before DraftKings, and he has stories about how. Um, you know, Jason Robbins went into their office, you know, he, he, he didn't, Jason, I don't think was fully committed to, or didn't announce he was going to start DraftKings yet. I mean, I think this was back in like 2011 and just asking questions about how the product experience worked and all that. Um, so there's not that many of us who are like still here that were back in like the early 2010s before it was like a regulated non-taboo category. My point is the, the pool of people too, it's like, because in some industries, 10 years of domain expertise, it, it's a lot, but it's not like there's people with more than that. But in this category specifically, yeah. just due to the regulatory and environment or lack thereof, it's a, it actually is like a fucking eternity, yeah. right? So, And I think that history that you're displaying is really critical. I actually like founders who can talk about the historical uh, uh, macro wins behind their industry. I, I was a history major in college. I don't know if you know that, but yeah. I mean, that make that, that, that tracks, <laughs> yeah, but I yeah. think we don't know the history of the industry. How can you pace and then lead that industry? Right. I, I think there's so many young kids who are like, yo, I want to be a CEO. I want to be a founder. They can't articulate what has failed in the past. What are the attempts in the past? What are the variations of product and go to market strategies in the past? Right. Like you have that in your head, you have templates of success and failure. So it's no, it's not sufficient to just say, "Hey, I want to be a CEO. I want to start a company." You should truly be a scholar of your industry, because that is the only chance you can actually find that very narrow seam to actually build something successful. Because otherwise, you're going to make the same mistakes as everybody else. Yep. You're going to be a fast follower of everyone else's same bad ideas. But if you can have the template of everyone's efforts, everyone's mistakes, everyone's success paths, and all their templates you can actually have a higher probability of finding your unique path. No, totally. So I think yeah. that is like something that I think, Joe, you're just like displaying there as an example, but as a pattern matching mechanism for myself, I like scholars of their industry. If you can't tell me the history of your space, why do you have the right to be a leader? It's actually space? a good, yeah. And, and I actually don't know. I mean, I'm sure this has come up in some discussions I've had with entrepreneurs who have come to, to me for capital and, and, you know, to you as well. But like, that could be a question I kind of copy going forward. Like just ask a founder, like explain like the high level in, ins and outs of your, uh, of this industry yeah. that you're going into, yeah. right? Just to see if they've done the work. Cause I agree having that historical context is super valuable. And, and you kind of alluded to this already, but chances are another entrepreneur tried your idea. <laughs> if it's not a mainstream consumer experience or B2B product offering today, chances are you know it didn't work and chances are there are reasons you could find out why it didn't work yep. so using simple bet as an example there, there's a company called um uh, winview games and winview game i remember you know when i was initially thinking about micro betting as we were thinking about pivoting into micro betting for simple bet winview games is a company that came up because they tried to do micro markets in the context of fantasy sports and we did, you know, diligence and realized that the reason why it didn't really work was because the market making was manual. It wasn't automated. It was part of this larger peer to peer fantasy format. And if you could automate the market 
mechanics, the the creation, suspension, repricing, resulting of the markets, and do it as a D to C sports book so that you don't have to pool liquidity amongst others. The quick, intimate user experience for micro betting, our thesis was could work, but because we were able to look at the wind view experience, for example, we kind of knew what not to do in terms of executing that. There, there's, I'm not going to go on a tangent because there's like a dozen other examples of like different things that have happened in my industry that you could just like do a little bit of diligence and learn about and it'll inform your execution going forward with respect to like what not to do for your idea because somebody, you know, WinView rates like $20 million. Like they had $20 million worth of trial and error that I was able to learn about in half a dozen phone calls. Right? Like as an entrepreneur, you should be able to do that. Yeah. I'm sure they spent years on it and they burnt $20 million. You don't want to re-spend re those years and re-burn $20 million. 100%. And, I, and, and there's so many different things that come across my desk where I see like... People make, fucking up. They're, they're, I'm getting sent decks and they're like with the same ideas. And I'm like, did I've you talk to this before. person? Yeah, I've seen story like before. I've seen this already. Yeah. And like you could do a little bit of diligence and you'll learn why it didn't work. And, it, you know, if you have a different approach, like you, you could take a different approach, but this type of stuff happens all the time. And I think maybe even just for a practical takeaway advice for uh, budding entrepreneurs, when you do your cold email or your initial pitch, right, talk about why everything else that try to be a billion dollar company or space didn't work. Yeah. Right. Like show the homework, show your industry knowledge because yeah. I think oftentimes, yeah, I think a lot of these emails be like, hey, I'm going to build the next Instagram. Yeah. And it's like, how many people wish they could be, be the next Instagram? Like, yeah. we all wish we could build the next Instagram. But question for you, do how do you feel about cold emails? Because this is kind of a, a hot topic in VC a little bit, right? I think it was Mark Andreessen who's like pretty vocal about like he doesn't take cold emails here. I don't know if it's Mark or somebody else. Yeah. Another prominent VC said they don't they don't fuck with cold emails because it shows that the entrepreneur wasn't um couldn't hustle their way in couldn't hustle intro. their way into getting a warm intro. i'm i'm very practical you can always ask me anything you can always send me an email just don't i, I don't have an obligation to respond yeah. and i don't have an obligation to say yes but like you should take your shot i think a lot of times when you say hey get a warm intro you just send people all out on side quests right and i think for people that really want it I think there is something bold yeah. and respect worthy to just be like, yo, you're just going to punch your way through a wall. Like I'm going to just like try to get in front of Joey and like yeah. tell him my thing. And it's going to be maybe a little bit awkward, maybe off putting, but like if it's high quality, you, you, you get my attention for 10 seconds and I'm like, okay, this guy's actually smart or this gal's actually smart. You earn 30 seconds, you earn a minute, you earn two minutes, you earn a conversation. I respect that. Yeah. So I think it's, all things equal, don't let anyone tell you how to do your business. If you really want it, go pitch yourself directly. And I think anyone that's been there started off with nothing. And I respect that hustle. That said, you're going to have a higher probability if you get Joey to say, hey, you know, Jimmy or Sally is super smart. You should talk to talk to them. Yeah. Um, I'm going to definitely respond um, basically out of respect to the strength of that refer. Right? So... For the buddy entrepreneur, right? Like you are leveraging the referrer's credibility with me to get that meeting. And the closer they are to me, like the more I almost feel obligated out of respect to take that meeting. Um, but it's not, a, so you're going to have like a 90% response rate versus a 1% response rate. But take those 1% chances. Yeah. And I think there's plenty of stories where that 1% chance, it's that first conversation that builds that relationship and it becomes like a lifelong business partnership or friendship. Yep. Have you I'm curious about yourself. Like, well, I mean, I, I think I've told this story a couple times, but the first capital I ever raised in my life, we just launched our alpha product for draft pod in like early 2015. And I posted on the daily fantasy sports subreddit. And I was like, Hey, you know, built this alpha site with a couple of my, you know, college classmates would love for you guys to try it out. And I wasn't like, it wasn't a real business yet. You know, it was kind of like a project that we started. I, you know, was hopeful that it could become a business one day. So I posted on the Daily Fantasy Sports subreddit. I was like, we're paying out. I think it was like $54 that, you know, that night. And, um, you know, 
half the people were talking shit. Half the people thought it was an interesting concept. It was one of the first, if not the first, no salary cap format around daily fantasy sports. And and somebody DM me and they said, I love the concept. Are you accepting investment capital as a way to invest? And I remember that, you know, we were on Sport Radar free trial, or it was actually Sports Data LLC, a Minneapolis based company that Sport Radar ultimately bought, um, that I was a client on free trial. And I think Sport Radar like was recently buying them and was gonna start charging us. And um, so I knew I was gonna need some money to pay for the data at some point. So I was open to taking the investment capital. And I called like uh, my stepdad's brother, like was a lawyer who did like VC stuff. And I told him about the situation. He's like, okay, I, you know, could put together uh, this thing called a safe agreement that I had never heard of before. And um, he's like, Let, let's send it with a 5 million valuation cap. That's pretty standard. I'm like, okay. Sure. Um, the guy asked for a pitch deck. I didn't know what a pitch deck was at the time. Um, so I, you know, put one together and, you know, it'd yeah, be pretty no chat GPT yeah. Pitch deck. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and it right. would probably be pretty embarrassed if like yeah. that initial deck got out, but, um, but sent him the stuff and he wired like $20,000 a week later. And that gave me one, it let us pay for the data after the few free trial, but two, it gave me the, the confidence I needed to go out and continue to, um, raise capital because I knew if this was going to become a real business, I was going to have to hire more engineers. I was going to have to hire designers. I was going to, you know, have to have more money for data because I wanted more sports than just whatever I was offering at the time. That's like a and then that kind of parlayed yeah. into, you know, a couple million dollars of VC money. And, and, um, but it was that initial 20 K from, uh, Vincent Monfredo in uh, Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania, that that got that's, us going. That's a cool story, and and, yeah. and credit to him. It wasn't crazy predatory, too. Like I feel like in that case, he could have been totally fucked over if we were just like a young kid, never understood even what a safe or convertible note or equity financing was. Yeah, he just thought it was a great idea, and you know, super grateful for for but it kicked his out the momentum support. and the confidence. Yeah. Have I taken investment from someone from a cold? Yes, intro? I was going to ask you that, yeah. and I don't think I actually have, but I would even almost say that our first meet was pretty random, yeah, right? right? Like, yeah. I think it was our mutual friend, Eric Dieppe, who's the CEO of a company called Manifold.xyz, a cool NFT uh, protocol uh, behind a lot of your, like, coolest NFT projects. Like, I think, did Lucy invite you or you knew Eric or who invited no, you? No, Eric invited me. Yeah. And I remember that night because I was really um, not feeling well. Yeah. And I was not going to go. Yeah. And he texted me like two or three times, like, dude, you got to come. There's a few people here I, I want to introduce you to. So I think I showed up. You probably, you, you may remember like an hour and a half Yeah, you were late. late. I remember I was like, you were at the back <laughs> in the corner. I was yeah. sitting next to Lucy. Guo, passes.com, shout out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're, both, we're both investors. Yeah, series A. Yeah, 49 uh, Series A, yeah. Yeah, huge, huge Series A. Yeah. Yeah, you were just like back. Like, I think I was, you were just back in that corner. Yeah, yeah, on the side. Yeah, because I got in super late. Yeah. I think like the entrees were already out, yeah. and uh, but no, I'm glad I showed up. Obviously, because uh, you like know, that's better in this iteration would not have existed. It would not have existed. I I still you know probably would have spun out D to C from Simple Bet in yeah. some way, shape, or form, but it definitely would have looked a lot different yeah. than it looks right now. It just kind of shows you how like one it's just amazing how life works right yeah. because that's like a super like probably it, it that evening i thought there was a 10 percent chance i was going and like it, it, if i didn't go then it's like this where we're not here um but two it just if you're especially if you're a young entrepreneur like err on the side of trying to like go to the thing, take the meeting, meet new people. You, you don't know exactly what's going to ha going to happen. Of course, you got to be careful with that too, because you, you don't want to be like one of those like Pure super climate. networkers yeah. be, because you got, you need time to build. Oh. Right. So that's when it comes it, it, you know, for you and, and probably to, to your earlier point of like respecting the introducer, right? Like, Eric is somebody we both have a lot of respect for. So we're going into that dinner with the assumption that everybody there is of high quality. Right. So that I'm sure contributed to when I told you about what I was working on, you were more yeah. interested in it than you would have otherwise been if, if maybe we just met at a random place yeah. that wasn't as curated. So, 
Um, so I guess err on the side of like, if there's somebody you really respect and they want you to go somewhere <laughs> or to meet somebody, then, then take the, take the meeting. I think to our mutual credit, like it was even, I remember that clearly from that meeting that you were on, you were able to switch it on and articulate what you had built with simple bit and what you wanted to potentially build. And I remember from that, I think we probably had one follow up call. And then I think I connected you with Jake. And then I think that call, I, I remember he like was super excited about talking. I was like, damn, like, or I, I, I think I just give you full credit. I, I, like, I think I already had a trip scheduled to Puerto Rico, like that next weekend or the following weekend. And I was yeah. just like, well, uh, do you want to come? Yeah. Like, you want to just book some shit and like, let's go to Puerto Rico together. Yeah. Like, we're already going to talk business anyways. Yeah. And you just sent it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember that. <laughs> it was like an afternoon zoom call and, and you proposed, I just come out. And I think I, I had stuff going on the next day, but I moved some things around and decided to come and spend, you know, I think a, like a weekend, yeah, a weekend with you guys. And, uh, and then decided we were going to go after this thing together. Yeah. And I think we, in retrospect, I think Jake and I were super lucky too, because I think we were looking at, sports betting as a category we were interested in remember back in that time 2021 like summer like all the crypto nft stuff was super <laughs> interesting and super pumped so we were looking at different nft fractionalization protocols and this and that and if we had just go heavy into nfts we'd be i saved you guys we would be fucked too like we would have been we would, be, <laughs> yeah. we would not be sitting here with like a yeah. huge uh, like a real regulated yeah business. like yeah. machinery around us too so i think just as much that like the surface area of luck, like I think the luck and serendipity really just feels uh, bi-directional for all of us. I think we're like, man, like timing, personalities, ambition, speed of execution. Um, like this is the type of stuff where it's like, man, like if you weren't religious, like, hey, there's something interesting about destiny, timing, all of that stuff. Only way I can think about increasing luck and engineering luck is, yeah, it's erring on saying yes erring on taking that trip, yeah. erring on sharing more context, more vo and, and just being like a good high integrity person. Yeah, I think for people that are busy and have done stuff, I think your bar of just like sensing integrity, sensing competency gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Yep. And I think one mistake that I see a lot of more raw entrepreneurs is that they're oftentimes too cagey or too def protective around their brainchild and it, it, it might be super secret sauce but probably it's not yeah and then i then if you half tell me your vision like you're not going to be able to articulate something reasonable if you're just hiding all the good stuff and like and usually people that are successful are too busy to just go steal your shit anyways a thousand percent so i think the jedi mind trick here is that you be more open and vulnerable again in the right context you don't just give away everything but I would err on sharing more context because it allows you to show more depth and substance than try to be cute and hide everything. And then people just don't have the time to have that second conversation or the third conversation because you're like, I don't know if you're just stupid or you don't have any insights. You got to have that conversation flow where you're showing enough intrigue where this is a master of their category and they have unique insights to actually build. I mean, at this point in betters, life cycle and we can use better as a case study but just speaking in, in general in the tech venture ecosystem i mean at a 375 and it sounds like you know maybe you can i don't know hint that you know there's so much demand for equity there might be more stuff coming down the line to be announced we're truly raising at growth yeah. capital light type valuations and revenue numbers right this is not just some pre-revenue bs fake hype business like there is real revenues that you can look up on different you know yeah, we haven't announced things. our revenue yet, but we have announced hundreds of thousands of active paying customers. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, in terms of skill set, would you share around these larger, more complex rounds that might not be obvious for the folks raising their first C check of like a $2 million or $3 million round? I yeah. mean, raising, you know, $15, $30, $50 million financings are quite tricky. And I think there's probably more war stories to tell even just with the fundraising of, over the last year. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, it's a good question. It's, and, and it's, uh, in some ways, actually I haven't 
thought about this. So it's the first time I'm being asked this, but like in some ways it's very similar and in some ways it's very different. So in the very early days, and we know this from better having raised, you know, $30 million series a really a $50 million series a, when you include the a one that we did um, off of predominantly a memo and a vision and a team and the domain expertise yeah, and, that's right. you know, off of your background and my background and Nikisa's background and Jake and his background and his audience. And, you know, the A was off of that. And then the A1 included, you know, we were building the team. We had hired Alex Ursa, Mike Denevi. We had a little bit more structure to what we were doing. I but remember those funny first interviews. They're, yeah. they're like, it, it, you know, it just reminds me of like, it could have been a really weird configuration. We had, it was very interesting head of media candidates, very interesting GC candidates. Yeah. I think the game, I think for, for Urs, I feel like you, you like narrowed in on him quite quickly. Yeah, because I had, I mean, particularly with the Simple Bet experience, I, I had seen great product people and technologists and not so great product people and technologists and, and you know, people who were well credentialed and good at getting the job versus doing the job. And, and, and you know, I just right away kind of knew Alex was a, was a stud. On the media side, it was different because... I that's not my background, right? And it was actually, I think we we honed in on a couple of finalist candidates, and and you you know, it's actually credit to Jake having really good taste. I was going to just say, yeah. yeah, I mean Jake, I mean who better than Jake to you know sort of help lead the way on that front, and and uh, you know he he guided us in the right direction, and you know obviously thrilled. Um, you know we have we have uh, Mikey Locks uh, at the helm of, of Better Media, but. Um, to get back to your question on financing, like in the early days, a lot of it is around the narrative and the story and the vision and, and, you know, it's narrative based fundraising and, you know, to speak super candidly, there's this like audacity of zero thing where before you launch, there's, you're, you're not subject to data, right? So you could like raise off of what it could be. And then the moment you launch, then you're subject to whether it's media, you're subject to, you know, follower metrics, engagement metrics. And then on gaming, you're subject to unit economics and revenue and, you know, your handle and your GGR and your NGR and your gross profit and the user bonus incentives and what your payback periods look like and your user retention and acquisition costs and all that. I would say the primary difference between the early financings and and the growth stage financings is that in the growth stage, and this has actually changed over the last couple of years, where in the growth stage financings, it's it's predominantly data-driven. But you still need to pave a way for, or to articulate what the future looks like. Because, you know, they're, similarly to early stage financing, like, obviously when we initially raised money for better and the initial, you know, pre-money valuation was $75 million, that memo was not worth $75 million, right? It was the future potential valuation growth that made the trade worth it for the people that participated. And we have since validated that to be true. It's the same thought exercise anytime you're raising money, right? Like we just raised it 375 post and our metrics actually indicate that like we're probably worth around that much, maybe even a little bit more than that. But it's less about that and it's more about like, can this thing be worth a billion dollars within the next couple of years? Yep. So you got to be able to articulate that narrative, but you're going to be judged heavily on the data that you have. Yeah. And the, the thing that I was going to mention that has changed over the last couple of years relative to how the data is being evaluated is it's the market is less about evaluating top line gross revenue metrics and prescribing multiples to that and it's more focused on gross profit ultimately net income and your unit economics and and that has changed more recently and i think that's why a lot of these technology companies that you know we were in a 14-year bull market that raised at you know these companies raised at very high valuations and they raised a lot of money and they were kind of just incentivized to keep pumping top line and they weren't as focused on efficiency. And now they're kind of in a bad spot where they have this big business from a top line perspective, but there isn't really a super clear path to profitability. You got employees with strike prices that are all out of whack and it's just not a good situation. So with better 
kind of grateful for the timing too, because we were able to raise our initial series a to get the company off the ground when the market was hot. Yep. We were able to raise off of a vision and off of domain expertise and backgrounds, but then the market corrected, which forced us to operate in a way where we were focused on unit economics and efficiency. And that's what we did. And we were successful and we're, we're, you know, not out of the woods by any means yet, but like we're getting there and we have a clear path to it. So yeah, just like had good timing, but th those are just some reflections on early versus later and just how the market's changed a little bit. The pro tip that every entrepreneur should do when they're raising capital is that you almost have to tell a story where you're going to guarantee three X the money. And you have to tell a story and a narrative how it's going to be a 10 X plus return. Yep. Right. So I, I think, and that's to, because the investors discounting, you know, you're showing 10 yeah. X and they're like, okay, like I can There's see risk it. and we underwrite yeah, it. Yeah, but it's yeah. also that investors aren't just free money bad guys. Investors have their customers who are their LPs. Right. And investors have a job and they make the big bucks because they need to return a set profile of IRR to their to their to their bosses. Right. So everyone has a boss in this world, yeah. so even though you think VCs are just like money guys who have infinite money. No, oftentimes pension funds, sovereign funds, rich families, uh, the police union. Right. These are all investors into these venture capital funds. And then the VCs are supposed to return uh, at least usually. Right. And all these change a lot. But the typical VC or the typical growth stage fund is supposed to return 3x within five years is their target. So they have a number that's already in their head that are trying to underwrite for every single investment. So if you know how the VC works and how they're doing the math, and you reverse engineer it for your business, that's how you can be tighter with your narrative. And I think I've seen the data. And like I think that we have a 3X here that's just based on basic execution. Like better will be a billion dollar business if we execute to plan, right? There's not that much crazy assumptions of what, this company needs to do over 2024 to hit that, to, to do a 10 X, like to get the three, 4 billion. Like we got to definitely like think about yeah. a couple other things have to go right. Right. Like, would you say that's fair? Right. Like I think it's like we are on a March to hit that billion dollar valuation given just the market multiples of things that are currently trading. Yeah. And then a couple other magic things we'll have to figure out to get to that 10 X. And I think there's good narratives and how we get there over the next two, three years. But I think that is like the ultimate formula or, or hack that I would encourage that more people should think about, which is one, understand the business model of VC, of growth equity firms, of private equity. So when you craft your pitch and your forecasts, of course, that needs to be data validated, right? You can't just like bullshit numbers, right? People will kick at, at the audited numbers and be like, you're lying to me. Don't do that. You get in trouble. You do that crazy enough. You might go to jail, right? Like <laughs> wire fraud, et cetera. So don't lie, uh, but think about the performance of your business. Uh, VCs can underwrite it really easy and be like, oh, I can write a big check. Yeah, no, so, so a couple of thoughts on that. So to totally agree that if you're a founder, CEO, operator, trying to intuitive, and, and, and fundraising is an important part of what you're doing, trying to, as best you can, intuitively understand what the investor's thought process is, is of critical importance. And you know, just thinking about it with my career, a lot of my fundraising success, actually like the timing of my fundraising su success is almost directly correlated with when I started investing myself, right? I started investing out of 305 Ventures like in late 2020, early 21, and the bulk of the financing that I've done in my life has been around since then. So um, now I think most of it is attributed to as an operator in sports gaming, I finally figured out the way in terms of product execution and business execution, but also just being on the other seat of the table has, has been very valuable. And I'm assuming that's probably the case for you, right? Since you started Anti-Fund with Jake, your appreciation for, you know, the investor side of the, because you've also been raising money for operating yeah. businesses too. I've also have been an LP HVM. for funds too. So like yeah. I've seen all three yeah. seats. And, so and me too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's super valuable. And Maybe it's not like super tactical advice for like the super young entrepreneur because it's just financially difficult to be an investor in operating businesses and VC funds and operate companies. But as soon as you have enough, you know, shekels to go after it, you should consider it just as an education, 
you know, process. So, so I totally agree with that. Um, from a better standpoint, yeah, like I, I don't think we would have been able to raise at 375 post if the investors who participated in this offering, which aren't just net new investors, but most of our major existing investors participated as well. Um, if there wasn't a clear path to showing a 3x to this being worth, a, a, you know, at least a billion dollars, just purely off of if you guys hit plan, this thing's worth a billion dollars. Now, what makes me excited about going beyond a billion dollars is that this there's such a profound incremental TAM opportunity in sports gaming. Like I, I think perhaps, and this has been the truth since day one, I think the most exciting data point about our business and our market is that FanDuel and DraftKings, who are the market leaders, and they're worth, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you'd value. They're, they're worth about $20 billion each, maybe FanDuel worth a little bit more, but they combine for about... I think the most recent data is like six and a half to seven million monthly active users, but they're in front of well over a hundred million gambling age sports fans. And I'm not saying that all of them will or even should be a part of this category, but there is a world where there's going to be 20, 25 million MAUs. And, and, and our thesis from day one, really my thesis, my entire career is the way you unlock that incremental TAM is by, by, building a product experience that's simple and intuitive enough for that incremental TAM who's not participated in the category to subsequently participate in the category. When you marry that with everything we're doing on the better media front to build a, a, a content platform that consistently goes viral, that resonates with a mass market consumer, that enables you to hack customer acquisition and really have unfair customer acquisition economics, there's a real path to creating that incremental TAM through this company. So really just execution and capitalizing on the incremental TAM opportunity alone, I think could get you to a $10 billion outcome. So I don't know if there's like this weird magical shit that we need to have happen for us to get that outcome. Um, but nevertheless, yes, we, we have some ideas for, for that yeah. stuff too. Um, I mean, I think to that scale, like you have to be changing culture to some extent. And I think that is actually what gets me most excited about this category we're playing in with better. Because as you know, I remember in, in Puerto Rico, we're talking about like, hey, I don't gamble and I don't really, I, you know, I, I appreciate watching great athletic performance, but I'm not like a diehard sports fan. But what's fascinating to me is that so many of us fellow humans love this shit. They like live and breathe and die their team. And yeah. no judgment, right? Everyone can, you know, have their hobbies and, and whatnot. I can just say that like, you've got to respect a cultural phenomenon that so many people you know, it's like one of the most one, two, three important things of their lives is their sports team and their team and their guys who are competing every single week or every every couple of days. And it's like people build, uh, you know, like friendships and communities around around these activities. If you're able to really increase town that that much, yeah, right, going from sub five percent of sports fans engaging in in a gaming experience to twenty five percent that's impactful from a cultural perspective, right? Like you kind of change the fabric of how people relate to sport, how they participate in sport, how people look at entertainment, right? Like you'll shift real entertainment dollars. Because I think one of the things that we were talking about is that uh, you could spend like a hundred bucks on a, uh, on a movie ticket date, yeah, right? Yeah. With a couple people, things yeah. are super expensive. You buy some popcorn, boom, you're spending a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you... Uh, have like a really exciting game where you're doing some bets and some parlays with your friends, like watching a game. No, it makes sports way more exciting than it otherwise would have been. Yeah. That that's why you know I, I remember when I was initially raising money for for Draft Pot back in the day. You know, I, one of my first investors, they at or prospective investors who ultimately became an investor, they they asked about the morality of you know paid fantasy and you know ultimately sports betting is something that I mean until prior to PASPA was kind of taboo. And the reason why it was taboo is because people kind of had this negative connotation around gambling and sports betting. And um, I've never had any moral qualms about the concept of sports betting or gambling in general, because as a consumer of it, and I got started playing, you know, season long fantasy sports as a kid with just a little bit of money that, you know, my, my dad would, would, would put up for our team and I just remember how much it made something I already liked watching, which was sports, significantly more entertaining. 
and, you know, it created a bonding experience with my dad and like, you know, that was kind of like the one thing we did together, to be honest, like growing up and it was great. And that's how sport outcome too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, and, and that's why I think this is great. It's like the, it's a, and that's why when we, like we at better, we're the only ones still who have proactively banned credit cards as a depositing method. And the reason why we were comfortable doing that is because we think gambling should be only about entertainment value. People shouldn't have access to doing it with money that they technically yeah. don't have. And the analogy I like to use is it should be treated like going to the movies. You spend $20 on a movie ticket you're not getting anything in return for that other than you're entertained for that for those two hours. So when you're placing a sports bet, you know, you should go in with the expectation that or with the understanding that ultimately and maybe this isn't a popular consumer facing thing to say, but I think I'm still the only executive that will publicly say the house will win over the long run. You shouldn't expect to gamble on sports to to make money, but but the but the prospect of you know getting eight out of eight on your better picks lineup and turning ten dollars into a thousand dollars the prospect of that potentially happening and that happens several times every day on better picks that's like a thrilling experience for a sports fan so um so yeah and 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 i think you know we've built a simple and intuitive enough product experience that's getting a lot better over time it's it's a product that every sports fan in america can intuitively and accessibly use and we're seeing that people are really enhancing their consumption of sports by by using the product maybe just popping out of just on the sports on the gaming side and just talking about broad tech and venture capital i've been actually spending a lot of time in san francisco plugging you know back to stanford plugging into all the generative ai stuff i mean i'm curious in terms of whether your team members are using chat GPT, using these AI tools um, just to be more productive on a day-to-day basis. Is, are, are you using these tools on a personal basis and prospects in terms of how, what I, I truly believe will be just a game change in terms of yeah. how humans interact with, with, with compute. Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's pretty remarkable what's happening in, in AI right now. And, you know, we're both involved in, in simple bet, uh, you know, myself as, as the founder and, is the person who led the last round of financing. And I think Simple Bet's a prime example of how machine learning, automation, AI is being leveraged to create new sports betting markets that otherwise would not have existed, right? So I think that in this industry is a very clear use case for that. Other use cases go into like user personalization, right? Like leveraging some of these technologies to better surface the right betting markets to users at the right time based on their past preferences, I guess to zoom out of sports and what I do, although, you know, that's kind of like, as you could tell, like what I'm maniacally focused on, like I look at a company, like uh, one of our investors, Aaliyah Capital is very into figure. I don't know if you've like looked at this business, but pretty fascinating what they're doing and basically robotic humanoids. Yeah. I mean, what are what are your thoughts on that company? I feel like this is in in some sense similar to what happened in 2021 with crypto. Mm -hmm. Like there's a kind of a crazy frenzy of valuation, a lot of capital going in. But I think the difference between AI and crypto was that I think crypto is a lot of speculation. And I think still, it's still one of the, I think I would say one of the best ways to just probably financial engineer like good financial outcomes. But I think just the, the daily usage is very low. Yeah. It, like the user experience is still very low. Yeah. Right. Like I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013. I'm a Stanford computer science and this stuff is like kind of still hard to use, whether you're MetaMask, this, that, this, that, like the chains and cross chain. Like, you, you know, it like. No, it's you, one of the can, reasons why I'm not more involved in it. Yeah. Right? It's, it's like complicated like, from a user experience perspective. Yeah. I really encourage everyone to just start playing with all the different tools, whether you're using perplexity as like changing that from Google search to using some of these AI search engines and conversational engines. We have to adopt these tools less you get left behind this is like you do not use ai tools you're going to be like the boomer that doesn't want to use a computer but i guess specifically though how are you using chat gpt and other ai tools on like a daily basis i mean this is not very academic but like i've been tr- studying quantum mechanics i'd rather have a conversation with chat gpt and ask quite like specific questions to it about like just you know different math formulas and equations and how it relates 
than like read a Wikipedia article and like search Google. Yeah, I was gonna say because the alternative before was you Google just this, Google it and then like and read then the article. Wikipedia article comes up and it's yeah. like yeah. But like I want Chat GPT is doing like the curation yeah, for and you, you and could engage in a dynamic discussion. Like hey, I want to like what does the Schrodinger's equation mean for this specific thing? Like oh, I, can you explain that in more simple terms? So it's like having like a actually kind of smart tutor with access to all of the internet. Um, so just from a learning perspective, I think it's been able to accelerate my learning. And part of your point is like just the fact that you're getting a bunch of reps leveraging chat GPT in a way that's beneficial to you. That'll be an advantage in and of itself. I think you I know compound my learning technology. faster than the norm, the normie who's not using chat GPT to learn. That makes sense. If I can yeah. learn 0.1% faster and I compound that starting now, yeah. I'll be smarter than you who's not doing that. Yeah. So I'm, not, so I'm like literally encouraging like everyone like, hey, use this stuff because this stuff is improving really, really quickly. Got it. We, we could be like, oh, AI is scary. Let's stop. It's not going to happen. There's too many smart people who are going to just do this. There's a capital motivation. And I think it's also just like human, human progress doesn't really stop. You can't just say, hey, we're not, let's not have nukes. Let's not have airplanes. So if you cannot stop progression, like be a part of that progression and then arm yourself as much as possible to take advantage of that flow. You might have seen some viral uh, things around like Cognition AI, which is a company that's basically built an AI to code to just do engineering. So you can like literally tell it, hey, I want to build a Tinder clone. And it starts coding it for you. And it's like pretty cool. Um, what do you think that means for the future of engineers? I think it's the same for, like, I think it's actually very interesting. I think when people think AI, it's like, oh, the blue collar jobs will be fucked first. I think it's low level white collar labor that gets fucked first. Because if you're like a shitty engineer yeah. or a shitty accountant or a shitty lawyer, that's actually much easier for large language models to replace. Right. Like to build like a figure humanoid to like build a wall or like build a house. That's probably actually a more complicated problem. Yeah. Than wrote rinse repeat like accounting. Interesting. Yeah. So I think it's not like the blue collar people. It's like the kind of lazy office nine to fiver who just like checking out. Yeah. That needs to be scared. But I think when he, when he, but like for overall engineers, it's like, if you're super smart at engineering, you can be super smart. You're you're not just like a coder. You're a problem solver. Yeah, you're a and smart I, problem solver. And I think yeah. the world will always have the need to solve problems. And yep. you need there still needs to be a human to prompt these AIs in the right direction. And I think even from content creation, I'm sure there's more and more AI tool that does auto editing for captions and this and that and this and that. Um, but I think content creators will have to just be bimodal, right? So like my prediction on content creation is that the people that are good at content creating will get even more powerful. So I think that like Jake Paul, for example, because he's already ex had escape velocity, he will get more and more powerful in this new AI world because humans will still want to see and watch other real humans. I think shitty content creators will be will get washed out. Because there will be AI generated avatars that are that are hotter, smarter, content, cooler than you, yeah, 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 that yeah. are like that, that that just pump out way more content than you. Yeah. So I think part of you know my internal motivation is that I gotta we we all gotta compound really really fast now to be on the escape power law before it's too late. Before it's too late. Before yeah. like the AI clones of us yeah. just are like way more hot and attractive, and entertaining than us. What do you think about the existential threat of AI to, I mean, there's a lot of people who talk about how this technology is potentially on a path to destroying humanity. I mean, Elon Musk is one of those that thinks there's pretty material probability yeah. of that happening within not just the distant future, I think within the next 20 years. I think I've just been, I've just seen how fast this stuff has improved. So I think when things actually are improving exponentially, it's hard to predict, right? So like, human minds are used to seeing linear physics, right? You, you, you throw a baseball, you track it linearly. Yep. You, you like walk across the street. Like our mind is used to linear moving things. Yeah. Like you don't see things exponentially. Like we're, our brains are not like nature doesn't really have exponentially growing things. Yeah. Right. Like one, two, four, eight, right. Like in 10 steps, it's, a thousand and then another more steps like a million and then yeah. another more steps like a billion right yeah, yeah. like it's very counterintuitive how fast these things compound right like that's when you know like warren buffett took like six years to get to a billion and then in the next 10 years he like got a hundred billion right but it took him 60 to get to one it's same thing with ai improvement right like it's a very counterintuitive hard to predict 
And I think I'm just seeing deals where like a year ago, all this AI stuff was like digital. Like I can just unplug you, right? Like it's just a fucking chat bot, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, fuck yeah. it. Like you're yeah, saying yeah. some mean shit to me. I want to unplug you. Yeah. Um, but like stuff with figure stuff with actually embedding these, uh, AI models into physical hardware. Yeah. I was like, this shit can like run around now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Like, uh, there will be more AI brain power than human brain power very, very soon. I mean, from an investment standpoint, what, what are you most excited about? I mean, we just spoke a little bit about like the existential threats and how to potentially counteract against them. But like, where are the biggest investment opportunities? You're, I mean, you mentioned this one business that's enabling individuals to almost like instruct the product development of different solutions, right? Um, what, what are like the other opportunities? I think the big AI companies now are what are building the foundational models. So like OpenAI made ChatGPT, which is like actually now it, it's like the most people use it, they just talk to it. But really the, the, like the business use case, that's really an API that like the better app could embed a, a, like a ChatGPT experience in, in the app and say, hey, like advise me on like what I should bet on today, right? Like, hey, I I, I think that LeBron looks a little soft, and I I like I want to root for the Celtics. Like, give me a give me some variations of pickums. That's like an enterprise use case of this. And OpenAI makes money because if we implemented with their chat API, we would pay them some money yeah. for every single API call. And obviously they behind the scenes have all these H100s computing all the answers. Yeah. So there's a few of these, right? You might have heard of Anthropic and Mistral. These yeah. are all like multi-billion dollar big things. Like Facebook has one. Like all the big tech companies are building their own large language models. Like Google has one called Gemini. Uh, Microsoft partner with OpenAIs, right? So like every everyone's like building their alliance of AI brains. Yeah. Now in 2024, I think it's very hard to compete with the OpenAI Anthropics unless you you have some like real academic research around like a better algorithm, right? Like they're all based on this like software program called a transformer. They're like new techniques, like sub quadratic transformers, other ways to, like mimic a neuron essentially. So unless you are like a super genius at the forefront of academics and mathematics, and you can like actually invent a better better type of a transformer like the raw building blocks of AI, probably very hard to compete with the existing foundational models, right? Because they have billions of dollars of just like compute and training data. And sorry to cut you off, but it's not just the money, but it's the years and years of, of work on it by hundreds and probably now thousands of the most qualified. Yeah, smartest PhDs yeah. just like cranking at this. Yeah. Um, so I think now it's like, I think the areas that are interesting are the applications, right? Like these are very uh, generic foundational models but you could train one to be like a, a sharp sports better like i i mean i don't like i'm sure someone someone's really doing this right they're probably just like creating a an algo trading bot based on llms maybe right like reading sports data and trying to make predictions i think essentially every single human endeavor will have some fine-tuned AI model training against all the historical data and compete with humans on every single vertical. So I think for as an entrepreneur, literally just like pick some space that like has a good market that humans like to compete in and you could probably build a reasonable, like some sort of business in that space. So I think that's an area, just like applications, uh, verticalized solutions of AI to a, a specific niche. I think a lot of infrastructure plays to enable people to build AI is an interesting category. Uh, for example, we, we better wanted to like build our own AI cloud. You, I don't think we would want to like start racking H100 chips in this warehouse, although we probably could. You'd probably want to use like a service to like abstract it away, have it in some cloud and like rent some time. So I think there's a lot of things that enable you to deploy AI faster, test, iterate, improve on prompts. So it's like the DevOps infrastructure layer for AI that's just like being built because no one really knows how to build for these things. Right. So it's like just same thing with like GitHub and things that I'm sure the engineering team has. There's like a bunch of different tools yeah. that we're just paying SaaS revenues to. There's going to be a class of things like that. And I think lastly would be just, and I think this is like starting to pick up with things like figure, uh, like physical manifestations of AI. And I think they'll just be super smart 
uh, robots that understand physics, right? Like, I think right now uh, the AI understands language pretty well. I think, like, the big next hurdle is, like, does it understand, like, 3D environments and physics? Although, like, self-driving and, like, things like figure tend to look like the robot understands physics, right? Like, uh, us na- able to navigate this room is very different from us being able to predict the next word that you're going to say. Like, those are pretty different. They seem to be pretty different problem sets. So I think that would be, like, a third area, which is, that like, translating, like, language prediction, which is what LLMs do, to navigating physics, navigating environments, and can predict, like, the motion, like, the future motion of things. Like, I don't know. It would be interesting to see, like, just, like, even going back to sports, it would be crazy to just see, like, figure compete in, like, sports leagues. That, right, like yeah, it'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, because I'm sure there are there already are robots that can like swing a bat and like kind of move around, but well, don't play the whole game. I mean, wasn't wasn't it wasn't it recently a big deal that I think an AI beat like a world chess champion or or somebody in a video oh, game go. or something? Yeah. yeah, chess has been solved by computers like right. since Gary Kasparov. But then your point about ro- robots understanding physics, yeah. right? Like a live baseball game, yeah, of just figure humanoid against like the national league all-star team. yeah i mean i i feel this like this is wild bro i mean we're it it genuinely feels like we're moving into like a like actual sci-fi like that's what our world is gonna like feel like yeah. i mean have you seen the sora demo which is basically you can uh there's a new like it's in closed beta but you you should you should like look it up and like insert it so Sora, like you, how do you spell that s-o-r-a you okay. like you could type out a movie scene and it like literally generates like photorealistic that's wild cinematic level like a scene and you're just like dude where do they get the they just scrape the content from the whatever they could find publicly available yeah i think they're Google. pretty tight lip because like right, I'm just, right. people are getting yeah, sued about yeah, this yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. As, but like basically <laughs> like i think they just train off of every single fucking video thing it's wild and like some people are, are saying that like this thing like understands physics because like like there's like this cool like hey woman walking in like in like sci-fi tokyo and it's it's like watching like a sci-fi movie like oh cool like, and it's like genuinely entertaining yeah so like my understanding is that they're working on like you you have script generation right because like writing scripts is like pretty doable with chat gpt and, and then you and you stack it with something like sora which turns scripts into text into scenes and then you just can like kind of generate movies as like, if hollywood didn't have enough to worry about already i think they're already getting pressure from like content creators that are just doing this for like essentially for fun right like yeah. i would say that like we're doing this for fun yeah <laughs> So, like, if we're doing this for fun and people are trying to, like, make livelihoods and have, like, union, like, shit around it, like, you just, it's just, like, you can't compete. Yeah. When you have these artificial costs of doing business when other people will compete doing it for fun. And then when people can do this off of computer and com- compute, it's like, ah, it's, you, you got to get back to, like, the core root, which is, like, can you have, like, the right creative direction then yeah so i think all the like the downstream labor gets commoditized yeah so again i don't like it's there's no like value judgment from me like i don't know if it's a good or bad thing i think it just will happen yeah so then if it will happen then you need to just be smart about where you want to be as this thing happens right it's like if you're a buggy driver and you see cars popping up it's like well maybe you like learn to drive a car right versus like Ah, like horses are better. Yeah. Because like gasoline smells shitty or whatever. Yeah. Anyways, food for thought for all of us is just like as we're building businesses and improving our skill sets, like where to spend our attention. Yeah, no, it's fascinating, man. It's gonna be interesting to to follow this and I'm sure over the coming weeks and months, I mean, there's gonna be more and more development and more news coming out and you know, open AI releasing, you know, further iterations of what they're working on figure doing the same other businesses in the category i mean it's going to be really interesting to, to to watch tune in thank you for the like comment subscribes and uh leave us feedback for what you want us to talk about more i think this is just fun and i think i need to even know from joey there's like so much depth and content and war stories we can keep telling so please give us your guidance and what you guys want us to dive in more yeah Until no next time yeah this is great man